Not only that, you don't even look like the guy that did it. He does it to himself. He says, man, I said, wonder why you, you, act, you didn't act like Jesus Christ said, well, I wonder why the poor guy did this. <laughs> he never did that before. <clears throat> I mean, you don't want to make it too obvious, obviously, but then you look like, you know, the same. Okay. Main features in epic split. Intelligence, direct reaction, penetration, isolation, these kinds of things in order to generate surprise and shock, mission stir from philosophy, acceptance of gaps and risks. Let me explain that. You see it very often in our literature when it's translated gaps and risks. But when you look at what they're doing, it really isn't a gap. The gaps that happen and the risks is an opportunity. Because you're letting the guy through so you can shh, take the pull apart. But now if you're worried, if you're terrain oriented or attrition oriented, you want to hang on to the terrain, the gap is very real. If a guy comes through, you get all panicked. But if you use the train as a medium for maneuver, then the gap doesn't assume all that important. You use it for leverage. That's one and depth. In fact, that's what happens to some people. They have a little tactical reverse. Christ, they start to panic and they make it even worse. You've got to think, say, wait a minute, I, maybe that didn't work out tactically, but is that guy stepping in the bag in another direction? I'm holding from a different direction. Don't take him on another direction. talked about that reserve. Matter of fact, you only want to use those people you have to. Once you have start having success, only use the people you need in order to keep the operation going. Keep funneling everybody back in the reserve. Keep reconstituting. Because there's going to be a time you're going to need that at some time to adjust an unforeseen circumstance. And to give you an analogy or a counterpart, let's say if you're in a political thing which suggests itself meeting you in my mind, you might have an operation when you're succeeding. It might be a long campaign then. Don't reveal all your arts. Hold a lot of it back so that he tries to adjust and you can give him with a huge counter adjustment because you save something back. In other words, not only reserves in terms of troops, ideas, and all that kind of stuff, too. You don't want to save too much back for losing, I might add, you know, because I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm saying where you have that opportunity, don't. Expend everything. Because it's essentially thing to reveal yourself and start to become more great. Okay, cost your position, those terms, we already talked about that. <coughs> so, when you said it was a outputs the blitz, in a sense, as I said, it's a reverse blitz. It's all in fact, when we had Ball here, it was very interesting. Uh, there was a meeting where they talked about the long argument of offense and defense. Look in here, BDI, can't figure out why they're getting all of them. Instead of money, he said, hey, look, there's no difference. You know, I'm just defense. You just defense, you start late. <laughs> they circle play. He said, what about the use of terrain? He said, makes no difference. You use terrain on offense, and you use that defense, too. He said, if you start thinking the other way, you start to come past and make mistakes. Okay, grill a counter grill off campaign. Let's look at that in the lab. Look at the counter grill. I want to bring these points in. Point. Vanguard and con support of people is dependent upon unknown inability from the grip of the crisis of its own make. They really make their own crisis. The regime. So the political part. Crisis and Vanguard represent the marriage of instability and initiative that creates an expanded rug. So this thought naturally occurred. That thought occurred that in order to dry up, one should strike at those causes that generate and exacerbate those prices. Can you give an example of that? Yeah. Counter grill campaign. I'll give you I want you to look at this on the back of the car back. Who's that first guy, Mikhail? Russian, Dukashevsky. Ramon Nagsaysa. Let me let you read this and I'll comment on it. And it's not that difficult to understand. It's sometimes quite difficult to implement it. <laughs> but here's where we normally have our props, these first two bullets. You also might want to read my uh, star down here. I've <laughs> 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 been working the wrong side.
these two are important. And that's what Max Hastings understood. In other words, these two are about the other play. Very often, we don't play this to ours. Then we're out here in the weeds just fighting all the time. You can't understand why we can't get there from here. These two are very important. He understood that. For example, in, the, uh, in his counter guerrilla campaign, when he was a defense minister, one of the things he did right away, sent his commanders out in, in the weeds to try to flush the guerrillas in that. And once it didn't succeed, he fired them. And not only that, he used his propaganda as they're incompetent and, and et cetera. And plus, he knew they were incompetent in some way. So he, he's at, I mean, he just embellished it even more so to demonstrate to people he was serious. He was going to try to get the government to get his act under control. Got rid of him. Then he put pressure on the president in order to sidetrack those politicians so they couldn't be in an important position, fire them if they could. And just, he embellished the hell out of that with propaganda. Made them even look worse than they were. Well, these guys were going down the tubes. So once you start doing that, you start demonstrating by acts that you're serious about this, you want to change them. Then you can start infiltrating their movement because now you start getting population on your side, you start to penetrate inside their system. When you get inside their system, then you start playing these kinds of games rather than having them done to you. A recent example, Weinberger made a very serious mistake. He came off looking like an idiot. He goes out there and defends that goddamn dip act when it was a piece of junk. And eventually, he was forced to cave in. But he didn't get a lot of political leverage out of it because everybody knows he was forced to cave in. You know what the dividend is, don't you? The Sergeant York, the uh, air defense system. Now, I happen to be a little bit familiar with it because I know the guys, the real guys in the building that worked the problem. They jumped, they knew it, and they just played every game they could. They leaked it everywhere. And people kept the heat on the Weinberger finally had to quit. In fact, one Marine Lieutenant Colonel really did, did a good job. Another point that Weinberger... What should have Weinberger done? He should have trashed it earlier. Did that Marine Lieutenant Colonel have access to Weinberger and tell him that it was Peter John? No. Because the intervening layers wouldn't let him get access, which I'll come back to in a minute. It's very important. You're on to a very important point there. I'll come back to that later. Just hang on. That's a very important thing you're talking about. In other words, Weinberger was the emperor who has no clothes. And some people, in fact, Carter had the same problem. Jimmy Carter. I know a guy quit over in the White House because he wanted everything to go up right through the uh, so-called command and staff line, through the system. Well, that's guaranteed. The emperor has no clothes. You're going to, you know, you're going to walk around naked all your life if that's the case. <laughs> You've got to set up informal loops. And you better have those informal loops everywhere. I don't care whether you're down below or up top side. I'll cite my own case to illustrate that point. I was a major in the Air Force, working in the Pentagon, and I was talking directly to the chief of staff, and nobody in between knew it. I was part of an informal loop. I can talk about it now. I'm retired. And then how it happened one day was I was sitting in my office down there. I was doing some stuff on the CapEx with the CF-15. And this exec came down who worked for uh, McConnell. And he told everybody else, he just out, and he said, can I talk to you alone? I said, yeah. He said, you know who I am? I said, Chief's got a problem. What's that got to do with me? He told me to come talk to you. He said, here's the information he gets. He said, write it. No. He said, well, how do we get the right information? Oh, well, that's easy. I said, I'll provide it, but he can't let on that he even has that information. But it'll give him a basis for asking questions so he can suck out the right information. So, I said, here's what he's going to get. I said, here's what he should get. And so McConnell was, uh, he gets up here and starts rubbing his head. Jeez, I have got right. Can we take another look? Of course, he knows it's absolutely positive. And of course, that didn't take. So the guy said, how do we get it to take? I said, always the way to get it to take. Now, when you hold the next meeting with the chief, have the chief say, you know, he's so bothered by this and upset that he could play real good, that maybe we get a, an independent team in there to look at it and have a fresh view of it. Well, Christ, nobody wants their turf <laughs> <laughs> Guess what? They coughed out the right answer. So we'll never get an independent team in there to take a look at it. Ooh. How many people 
people here ready to start to vaccinate? And we've talked about that informed. He didn't even understand what those informed open cases really are. So I've talked to IBM people and other people. You can't compromise. And I've been on the other end as a commander of a base the same way. Informal connections. I was getting information. <coughs> I knew about it. I didn't let on know. I just said, somehow I don't feel comfortable. Let's take another look at it. And if they resisted me too much, I said, well, maybe we better send another team to look at it. You'd be surprised how quickly their views would change. Remember, if you have to go through a lot, each guy doesn't want to look bad above, particularly when you have a career mentality, you're worried about the next position up. I want to be sure that, boy, I don't look good. Well, that means there's some bad information that's not getting there. He may need, that may be the most important information. Another example, mine, I know my own, was I had a three-star, two-star general as a colonel. We didn't get along at all. In fact, he hated my guts. I did his, too. But then the point is, and there were some reasons, but in any case, he said, can I talk to your people when you're not there? I said, of course. I may ask them embarrassing questions. Ask them any question you want. I couldn't care less. Because you don't even have to tell me. Sneak in or anywhere. Oh, I don't care what. There are any, send any of your people and I couldn't care what. We thought that was crazy. But it worked. I trusted my people. I worried about the least. They might even make a couple mistakes. So what? If I can't recover from the mistake, I shouldn't have a goddamn job. <laughs> As a matter of fact, on the uh, lightweight fighters, if you know the air staff system, what happened, and how that works, the air staff system, the way it works, you have the pack panel and you have the two star level of the, uh, the what they call it, in the I can't remember, anyway, they have the uh, pack panel, the major general level uh, board to uh, staff board or something. Then they have the air council, the three star Vice chief and chief of the When we were going for the lightweight fighter, we had that. We did it all by word of mouth. We had hardly anything down in writing except for money, and we had it totally obscured because there were a lot of generals who were trying to cancel out. And so we were doing all our design work over the phone, so they couldn't track. And they knew what was going on, but they couldn't find it. And we siphoned off money from certain accounts. Of course, we had to deliver, but we had we had friends in place. In fact, that one four-star general told me he knew what I was doing. He says publicly, "I'm going to condemn." This operation, because if you give it up, I'll kick you in the ass. <laughs> so even some of them were on board, even though publicly they had to show a different face. And uh, so what happened was they had a rig, such as the air staff board. So we would go through the air council and the air staff board, but then we could clean out the air council. So I was told that we penetrated the system. I said, okay, great, we'll go up to the air staff board and we'll, we'll hook around the air council and give them an information on the brief. In other words, we'll get it to the chief and some other people on the top side. The selection was on board, too. So then we knew that, so we got the decisions set up such that they were made before the Air Council, I mean above the Air Council. And then after the decision was made, then, then I was sent in as a briefer to inform them, and they thought it was going to be a briefing on how they were going to be able to deliver it upon the decision. I go in there and say, oh, incidentally, this is information uh, briefing only. The decision was made. We just want to show you why we made the decision. Dr. Chief. <laughs> why am I glad they're about dying? Take out a support, it's more fun to take out a superior. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't advocate that. What I'm trying to say, we didn't take them out per se, well, we had to get something done, and they were in the way. And we did have a support to get a superior. So, these, we totally had to trade their system. The reason why the people knew it was the right thing to do was they were making these insane arguments for trying to keep some things they just didn't have to get. They had all these paradoxes, and they go, what happened? But of course, you don't see that way. No, that's the kind of thing you So those things do go on. In fact, this Marine Colonel, he had total support. He's got a lot of support. They didn't realize it. Marine Lieutenant Colonel was really, because the guy's really cleaned up the divot. You know, you've heard Denny speak the speeches he made on his other thing. Without this Marine Lieutenant Colonel, it would not have happened. Good news. 
But see, that thing could have been killed a long time. There's some other systems. It's just a defending trash. They think it's embarrassing. It's wrong. See, like I tell people, you know, look, at, let's say you lay out a theory and you want to go ahead with it. You know, just because you have a theory, you looked at some previous evidence and that, that doesn't mean it's all right. You may ask for something. And so you really eventually have to test it in a hard world, a world of hard knocks, or we call it test it. And I think that you've got to be prepared and be embarrassed by the results of the test. And if you're not prepared for that, you're wrong business. Because that's the whole idea, is to find those flaws. It's not just like, hmm, nothing's wrong. You look like an idiot. You've got to be prepared to be embarrassed by the results of the test, or by the experience. That's part of the game. And if you try to cover it up, and someone knows about it, they're going to use it to your displeasure at the moment you least like them to use it. Like when you're most vulnerable. Maybe I like them. Now we get rid of this guy. Over the side. I just can't emphasize that enough. Very important. In any case, let's get more pragmatic why that's important, too. And I've already said it. Boards that support for real work on why. <coughs> I just said it in my way for them. Then you can start looking inside their operation. Make them blind to your operation. Then you get left. Okay, let's take a five minute break. We'll come back and go over the categories. Why do we stay there? The, the argument tend to 
fall apart. Okay, so these are the kind of things. Now, with that in mind, let's lay out what I'd like to call the essence or a picture of the attrition warfare. And basically, what you're doing, you're creating these sweaty knees kind of things, destructive force, and I lay down protection and mobility. So you're interplaying these, and here's your payoff. But you read it in a comment. And note this. Isn't this a noble aim? Compel enemy to surrender and sue for, for, for peace. What if they don't show up? <laughs> That's nice, but if they don't show up, it doesn't take. What do you get out of that image or picture that I display there? Anybody? What? Keep going. You're right on. What did you say, John? You're on the right track. It's like you know, you're just beating them into submission. Therefore, it has a high physical content. Remember, we talked about moral, mental, and physical. The attrition has a very high physical content. That's the point. You're right on it. Like beating them up. That's physical. That in mind, then let's go look at maneuvers. Now, these kind of things begin to become important. Ambiguity and ambivalence, the idea that you generate that surprise, you try to do it again. And if you're talking about war, you're not talking about fire, you're talking about movement, fire and movement combination, whether you want to call it chain chi, egg pump, spare pump, whatever you want. The idea in one hand, you're trying to tie them up so you can destroy this vulnerabilities and weakness on the other hand. And instead of having measures of success, note I got indications, they tend to be qualitative. And the key idea is any phenomena that suggests inability to adapt to change. As long as you get him in a position where it makes it very difficult for him to adapt. And I'm just giving some examples, abuse disorder, high prisoner counts, that's right. When he starts getting all kinds of prisoners, that means he's very confused and disordered. Can't keep up. Let me cite an example here. Many of you people have seen a basketball. And you see, ever notice when one team starts getting the leverage, the other tries to come unglued? You can't measure that. All you know is they're not working together. What do they do? The first thing, let's call timeout so we can get our act back together. You can't measure that. So why do we use targets destroyed in body count? Because we can measure it and we can insert it in the computer. I guess after the bar chart goes up so high, they're supposed to throw the towel in, but they don't. Guderian, when he went through France, another example, he sensed it. He said, my God, I can smell a rock in the French army. Now's the time with gold for it. Couldn't measure it. He just, now's the time to really stick it in good and hard. And they did. At least until they got the done. Remember, if you look at a campaign, they were trying to make them go slower than that. Even go to hell, they keep <laughs> diving right into their system. Would you consider the, the Iraqi Iranian war somewhat like that? I haven't looked at that. They, they're, they're back to Verdun, World War One. You know, they're attrition <laughs> warfare. Oh, back in the yeah. Not maneuver, attrition. attrition. And they're just, you know, pumping bodies and people and artillery back and forth. But know what we're talking about. You can't measure it. You sense it. Just because you can't measure it doesn't mean it's unimportant. Remember I said that earlier. How do you put pressure in a computer? How do you put the uh, inability to keep up into the computer in a mental sense? But by looking at certain events, by what's unfolding, you say, hey, these guys are coming unglued. They're not keeping up. Now we can leverage. Or we can set events up so we can put them in that position so we can leverage. Okay? Now. Let's look at essence of maneuver conflict. Create, exploit, and magnify these kinds of things. Ambiguity, ambivalence, deception, mass transit maneuvers, effort. Note what I got here. Let's define ambiguity. Alternative or competing impression events as they may or may not be. In other words, you want to pump a number of impressions in a guy's mind. Because he's got to sort that out. What does that do? It generates many non-cooperative centers of gravity, many non-mental cooperative centers of gravity. It slows it down. It makes it more difficult to adapt. An outgrowth of that ambiguity, ambivalence, 
pretty soon he starts getting con contradictory information, opposing information. In other words, he starts vacillating back and forth, indecision. Not only you slow him down, you're paralyzed. But there's a different form. Deception can be impressions of events there. In any case, note this: impression of an event or impressions of events there not. That means good picture, wrong picture. What isn't that nice? Just totally incorrect. What's my point? If you examine ambiguity with deception, ambiguity is confusion and disorder. Deception is a form of order. It's a false order, but it's an order. But it's an order. Now, it turns out people are familiar with these things. You can generate ambiguity more rapidly than you generate deception. The reason why you generate confusion disorder more than you generate order. It's quicker. Not only that, it's less risky. So ambiguity is faster and more risky. On the other hand, if you realize the deception, there's enormous leverage. Yet you read military history, they never talk about ambiguity. They're always talking about deception. They just can't say ambiguity. A little hard to understand. And in some of his maneuvers, he was really talking about ambiguity. He never said the word. He kept saying deception. That's not deception. I might add, he's not the only one. So one is less risky and rapid, more rapid ambiguity. Riskier, takes longer, more liberal. Let me illustrate some examples to give you a feel. Invasion of North Africa, 1942. We got on there pretty easy, virtually a free ride in. 